Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, California. And today's topic is uh, our favorite one, the one we promote the most, which, which is what is good soil. Uh, our industry, for some reason, uh, doesn't have a clue. So I've been communicating with them over and over for the last few decades, and they don't seem to get what real dirt is. Now, there's a difference. Our industry is horticulture. And on the other hand, there's agriculture. The research that I follow is from agriculture. They seem to know what they're doing. Horticulture doesn't seem to have a clue because they keep on promoting. Um, essentially, what they're doing is promoting ground up pieces of wood as good soil and expecting plants to grow in what I would tell you is, you know, they call it compost, and I tell you it's, it's decayed, pulverized, dead trees is what they're telling us to grow plants in, and it's not really working. Um, so we'll explain why. So first thing we'll do is kind of explain what plants really want from the dirt. So now we were taught, now I was taught, yeah, a few of you are old enough. So when we were kids, we were taught that trees, a typical tree, the roots were a mirror image of the top. That's what we were taught. But we learned later that, no, that's not true. The roots of plants, you know, they told us about tap roots, and you, I've dug up trees all my life and never found anything that looked like a tap root. Uh, the roots tend to grow in the top foot of soil. And, you know, you've seen in the news when trees fall over, that much dirt comes up with them. So what do roots need from the dirt? Well, some of that ex would explain it. Number one, they need the soil to hold moisture for them. So if roots are dry, they're in big trouble. So on a plant, typical plant, the above ground parts are all covered in wax. So the plants don't really lose much water up here. They lose a little bit. Uh, they have little holes in their leaves called stomata that open and close according to how much carbon dioxide they want to take in, how much oxygen they want to release, and how much water they can afford to lose. Uh, when the plants are dry, the stomata just close up so they don't lose any more water. So they have these little openings in the leaves, bottoms of the leaves that determine how fast the water can be left. But the roots underneath the ground are just don't have that wax covering. And they want to pull in the water from the soil. The soil has got to be moist. So when this plant is operating, when it's green and growing, the soil's got to be moist. If you just pull this plant out of the ground, shake off all the soil or the growing medium, which we call in the trade, the medium, and you leave the roots dry in the air, you know, of course, here, if you were in New Jersey, there would be moisture. Here, the air is fairly dry. Within an hour or two, this plant can be dead because the roots have totally dried up. So the soil, number one, on an active plant, it's got to be able to retain the moisture around the roots. It's got to have some moisture in it at all times. Number two, which we don't get enough, which doesn't get enough press, they need to breathe. And they need to breathe oxygen. So on a plant, plants make oxygen, but it's the green parts of the plant that make it. The rest of the plant, the trunk, the stems, the roots, they all have to breathe oxygen. Uh, plants, you know, the original plant didn't make oxygen until they captured blue-green algae and put it in their leaves. And then they would be able to make their own oxygen. But before that, plants were just, well, the, you know, there weren't any plants before that, but the rest of the plant consumes oxygen just like we do. Now, unfortunately, unlike animals, there's no way to get oxygen 
from the leaves directly to the roots through the plant. They don't have a, a blood system like we do. Uh, they've got a system called a phloem which brings nutrients from the leaves down to the roots but it doesn't carry much oxygen with it. There's no blood cells in a plant. So the air goes out the leaves, the oxygen goes out the leaves through the soil to the roots. So the soil's got to be what we call permeable so that the air can get in there and keep the roots alive. And that's one reason the tree's roots don't go very deep. Not only they have to capture the water falling on the ground from rain or irrigation, but they also have to get the air going in and that doesn't penetrate that far. Now, I should put some terms up here. The ability to hold moisture is the porosity. And the ability to breathe is the permeability. And we see people riding in horticulture making, getting that term totally mixed up. They tell you, oh, the soil, you know, this clay pot breathes, it's real porous. Well, clay pot is real porous, it doesn't mean it breathes, it means it holds water. The clay absorbs water. So, uh, but, you know, so we try to keep those two separate. Uh, porous soil means it holds water. Permeable soil means it holds oxygen. And those two terms are somewhat... Um, they don't go together. If you have one, you don't have the other. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. Now, number three is actually insulation. Roots operate between a certain temperature range. It's generally high. It's generally between about, well, when they're active, it's got to be around 40 degrees to about 85. They can't go much above 85 degrees and not get burnt. And they can't, can't go much below 45 and stay active. So uh, say 45 to about 85 degrees Fahrenheit is what you want the roots to be. Now, in the lower 48 states, there is no ground that freezes. So we're lucky there. The ground does not freeze. It always, you know, if a few inches down, it's warm in the ground relatively. I mean, if you're in Minnesota, it's going to be, you know, in the 50s, 40s, 50s. Um, but still warmer than the air. So insulation. Um, four, I'd put stability. It's got to hold the plant upright. And we've pretty much taken nutrition off the list because most plants do not get nutrition from the soil. There's a few, a few classes of plants that do. We'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll talk about it more in a couple of weeks. But most plants do not get their nourishment from the soil. And that's the main thing that I keep hearing from, you know, the uh, people who tell me that I'm, I'm making soil wrong, is that they're telling me, you got to have this dead stuff in here for nutrition. The soil, you know, you got to make a nutritious soil. Where in nature, we, what they've determined, the, you know, the people who study plants and ecosystems have determined that they're not, the plants, most of the plants that they studied, which are woody plants, you know, shrubs and trees, do not depend on the soil for nutrition. They recycle dead leaves in nature. So, um, and then I, you know, I kind of quiz them sometimes, that people are telling me that, can a plant get nutrition right out of this? Not really, they can't. They're not cannibals. They can't suck on dead wood and get nutrition out. There's some, there's some other processes involved. Um, but anyway, these are the things that soil needs to provide. And, um, we'll t and I'll explain how that works. So here is, if you had this at your home in your garden, you would be very happy gardeners. So this is sandy loam. Uh, this is what a farmer dreams of having. I got this off a farm in Irvine. The guy told me this is as good a soil as he's ever farmed on. Uh, that's inland from the 405 freeway going toward the hills there. But sandy loam is what a farmer wants. Uh, back in the 50s when my father grew plants in containers, he grew them all in this. The majority of them in this soil here. So that was perfect soil. Now, 
The word loam has also been misused by horticultural journalists. Uh, so loam, what that means is that this soil contains the three major components of good soil, which are sand, silt, and clay. It means it contains all that. Now we get journalists saying, make your soil a rich loam by adding a lot of compost to it. That's what they're telling people. Add compost to it, make your soil a rich loam. They have no idea what loam really means. So sand, silt, and clay, you gotta have those three components. I mean the silt is not super important. Now everybody knows what sand is. So here's sand at the beach, you know what sand is. Um, well first, let me tell you what soil is made of. So when nature makes soil, it takes a piece of granite and breaks it up. That's how we get this. You can see the colors are quite similar. Um, the white part of granite, and I think this is granite or somewhat metamorphosized granite, but the white parts of this rock are quartz. We have a video going right now. Oh. It's on YouTube. Yeah. It's on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so the white parts of this rock are quartz. Quartz is the same as glass. The, the sand, the white parts, when this rock breaks up, become the sand. That's what sand is. It's quartz. Uh, you can melt sand and get glass. Uh, when, you know, when lightning hits the ground, you get glass. <laughs> That's because the ground is mostly glass. The dark parts are the feldspar. So the quartz parts, which are sand and silt. Silt is actually smaller sand. So sand is the bigger chunks of quartz. The real fine chunks are the silt. The darker parts are feldspar, which is silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is quartz but it's silicon dioxide associated with some other minerals like aluminum or iron. Iron would make this more reddish brown. Aluminum would make it more gray. There's other minerals that get stuck in that um, um, kind of uh, crystalline structure there that make it turn this color and that becomes the clay. So the darker parts become clay, the lighter parts are the sand and the silt and that's, that's soil. Whereas, you know, other nurses tell you, oh, you grind up a tree and you get dirt. Eh. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So, now the way these things create what we want, let's get a kind of a visual aid here. So, this is not really to scale too well. The tennis balls in here are supposed to be the sand. If they were to a better size, they'd be beach balls. So the sand would be the bigger balls in here. The silt, which is relatively around us like sand is real. If you look at sand on the beach in a microscope, it's fairly round. They're chipped, but they're, they end up fairly round. Uh, silt is smaller pieces, about one-tenth the size of sand or smaller. And then really tiny flat flakes would be the clay. Now, I use lentil seeds in here, but I should have used confetti. confetti would be more the right consistency, real flat flakes of, of uh, the feldspar. So that's how soil is built. The spaces between the sand and the silt are the permit, create the permeability of the soil. Air flows real well through the bigger, so you know the spaces, not only do you need spaces, but they have to be fairly large spaces, so airflow there's a lot of friction between smaller spaces, so the bigger the particles, you know, if it's gravel, air goes right through it. Sand, not quite as good as gravel, but still, uh, the airflow through it is pretty good. When you have spheres making up the volume, and they're solid, the spaces between the spheres is about a third. The spheres are taking about two-thirds of the volume, the spaces between them is about a third. So if you have a very sandy or silty, sandy soil, you've got a lot of air spaces. The clay, 
the spaces between that is too small. So when you have clay stuck in here, the air can get through. Now the, the space between the sand and silt is about one third of the soil volume. If your clay content gets too high, more than a third, soil is all filled up with clay, doesn't breathe. So it doesn't take much clay to make soil a clay soil where it doesn't breathe. Uh, you can't have that much clay in there to have a breathing soil. But the clay does do a good job of holding water. Now the way soil holds water, i got to explain that. So you've got soil particles. All the particles of soil, even the flat ones, they all have a negative charge. They're all charged particles. Water itself, oxygen and two hydrogens, is ionic because the side with the oxygen is negative, but the side with the hydrogens are both positive. So there's a positive charge on one side. So the positive charge side of this water sticks real good to any soil particle, at least one layer thick. And it kind of, like magnets, they all kind of come together. So the water is held by the soil because it's char the soil is charged, the water is charged, and they all stick together, especially one molecule layer thick on these soil particles, very strong adhesion there, attraction between. Now you can see on the sand, the sand may be a million molecules thick, so the water layer only one molecule thick is pretty, pretty thin layer on there, but they said clay particles can be as thin as 28 molecules. So if you got a clay particle and it's covering, it's holding one molecule of water, that's quite a bit of water compared to the clay versus the sand. So clay soils hold water really good. Um, what we know is if you have a foot of dry sand, if you add about a half inch of water to that, you can totally wet all the particles and the water will start dripping out the bottom. If you have a, a column of clay one foot high, it would take about five times as much water to totally fill all the, gaps, all the gaps around the clay. So clay soil can hold four to five times as much water as sandy soil. Just because of the shape. The shape and the size of the particles make it do that. So even though this is mineral, this is mineral, this is all mineral stuff, the shape, and the, uh, the shape of it, certainly on clay, being flat, uh, being real tiny, you cannot see clay particles. They're, the individual particles are invisible to your eye. You can see sand, you can see silt. But uh, clay is too small to see. Now, one way to figure out about how much you have in your, in your soil, this is not perfect, but it's pretty, pretty neat. So you take, we take this soil, put it in a, an empty jar, about halfway, two thirds full, add water to the neck, a few drops of dish soap in there, and then shake it really good. Get all these particles broken up into individual pieces, and then you let it settle. And on this jar, you know, from the back you can't see it, but, uh, you know, it takes a day for the clay to settle out. So if I do this to the water, swirl it up a little bit, you see this stuff coming off the very top is the clay. The sand settles very quickly, Sand being a bigger round rock will settle immediately to the bottom. Silt on top of the sand. Clay settles on top of everything overnight. So you can see roughly what the you know what we want to know is the clay content. Uh, and on this one, it's only about that thick. Uh, it's maybe eight percent. I don't think it's ten percent. I think it's less than ten percent clay in here. Um, so a very low volume of clay in this soil sample from this farm. Uh, sand looks like the sand is going to be close to 80, 85 percent. A little bit of silt in there. Um, some of the clay can sink down to the sand and silt, but you know this is a pretty good, pretty good check. If you have more than 33 percent clay in this jar, you've got clay soil. And it won't breathe. It won't breathe very fast which limits the root health of the plants, or 
the rooting depth also. The roots can't go very deep in clay. It's not poisonous though. It doesn't kill the roots. It just doesn't allow them to live in it very deep. That's the main thing to know about clay. Unless, you know, nature knows how to improve soil. I'll, I'll mention that next. But uh, so that's soil. Now, so they've, the geologists have categorized the soil all across, pretty much all across the U.S., but uh, there are maps of Orange County that tell you where the different soils are. So uh, the hills back here are called sandy clay. So there's a lot of sand in there, but there's enough clay to block the airflow through the soil. Um, now the rivers bring that, you know, rain and water and rivers bring that soil off those hills toward the ocean. The first thing to settle out is the sand. So the soil, the area right below these hills, you know, Tustin, Santa Ana, most of Orange, Anaheim, it's all sand. We have, that's why we have this soil. They said 405 freeway east, sandy loam. The clay takes longer to come out, so as the rivers head toward the ocean, Fountain Valley, Costa Mesa, clay. That's, it, took, it takes longer. As the water slows down to enter the ocean, the clay falls out. Now, right along the riverbeds, you'll still get sand. But in the flat ground, you know, they used to let the rivers run wild, so most of the flat areas between the rivers is all clay. So that's how we're set up here, and you can check it by doing a test like this and you know if you've got a thick layer of clay in there I'm sorry you know it's, it's, you're stuck with that it's hard to fix clay um, now the proportions so let's go um, let's do it this way again so sand silt and clay so a sandy loam soil is going to be roughly 60, 30, 10, up and down about 10, 15 points in either direction. A rich loam would be more like um, 20, maybe 30. 50, something like that. You got a higher clay content or even 25% clay. Um, it's interesting. So in the old days, the farmers didn't want the soil right here. They wanted the soil in Fountain Valley because there was no irrigation in those days. You know, back in the 1800s, up until maybe World War I, they hadn't really done much with irrigation. So the soils that held the water the best in the spring had more clay in them. So they were farming, you know, they f before World War II and everything, they were farming in Fountain Valley, the richest land in Orange County, because it had the clay. That's what rich loam is. It's not, it doesn't have compost in it, it's got clay in it. But now that we have irrigation, and we know that you know, roots, the more oxygen they get, the more vigorous the growth of the roots. So, I mean, you know, the, the three things the, to get to the roots, you, you, know, you can't do much about the air. You can't really influence the air of a plant unless you're in a greenhouse. So the mess, best thing you can do for the roots, more water, more air, more nutrition. You can, you can optimize those three and the plants grow faster. So in this in sandy soil, you got more air. You already got the more air. So you have to water it. So the guys who are on soil like this, they water pretty much every day. They fertilize a lot, but the plants grow really well on that soil when you get the, especially with the irrigation. Get that irrigation going, you get some real good growth, better than you can in the clay soil. Yes. Well, that's what a farmer would like. Most farmers want that that mixture. But it, you know, it could be 70, 20, 10. The less clay the better. Yeah, just so you're not too heavy in the clay. Because yeah. then you get more airflow in the soil and that really helps the plants. Uh, 
Our cat thinks everybody's its mom. <laughs> okay, so rich loam, and then you have, if you have clay soil, you're going to be maybe 35% clay or higher. Doesn't matter what the other numbers are, if your clay content is 35. Now we've been told there is no soil in Orange County that's above 50, 50 about 55% is the highest that we go in Orange County, maybe 50% clay. That's the highest we glow. So I've been also told by the egg people that you can mix any clay soil in Orange County with equal parts of sand. It'll drop that number below 30, 35, 30, and the soil will breathe. So equal parts of sand with any soil in Orange County, it'll breathe. It'll drop that clay content below 35%. So. So, you know, don't believe the people who tell you you add sand to clay so you get concrete. You, got, you need, clay never makes concrete. <laughs> you need sand and, and cement to make concrete, sand, rocks, and cement. Um, all, all good soils have these three things in it. So, now you, you can get by without clay at all or without silt. You just have to water a lot more if you have sand. So you can still grow plants in it. Okay, now if you've got a real bad clay soil, say you've got 40% here, uh, maybe 40% that, 20% sand, that's a really nasty soil. To, it doesn't breathe too well. Um, the way nature improves the aeration of soil, so they're, they haven't known about this that long ago. I think it was back in the 50s when we, they invented uh, electron microscopes that they can actually find, they actually found out that most of the roots in the ground underneath the tree weren't the tree's roots. They, they, were, just, they were just so surprised, they said, most of what we thought were roots in the ground were actually this, the fung, hyphae of fungi plants that were associated with the tree's roots. So that's called a, a mycorrhizal fungus. So when plants first came on the land, I don't know how many billion years ago that was, I didn't check my numbers recently, it might be three billion years ago, they couldn't get any nutrients out of the rocks that were there or out of any of the thing that was lying on the soil. This fungus was able to dissolve the rocks and get some minerals out of it. So the, plant, the algae that was on the shores partnered with this mycorrhizal fungus back when plants first came on land and were able to eat the rocks. So the fungus does the hard work, um, but it can also make the soil a little better place for the plants to live in also. So mycorrhizal fungus, well it's a combination of things. So the mycorrhizal fungus, so mycorrhizal fungus provides plants with most of their nutrition needs by dissolving things around them, either rocks or the wood, you know, the dead stuff around them. Um, the plants in return provide them with sugar. So sugar is the plant's storage. So a leaf in the sunlight, what it's supposed to do is make sugar. So the Photosynthesis takes the carbon dioxide in the air, the water from the soil, uh, the energy from the sunlight, and changes it into sugar. So carbon dioxide, CO2, water molecules, H2O, sugar molecules, C6H12O6. It's just a combination of those things, and it's kind of like a store of energy. It's a chemical storage of energy, which sugar is, but most of this plant is made out of cellulose which is also sugar molecules rearranged so we can't eat them. So plants are made out of sugar, they operate on the energy that is stored in sugar. The fungus body is mostly silos too that's from sugar and it operates with sugar too. So in, in, in exchange for sugar from the plant it can do its thing and provide the plant with its thing. But all those little 
So they said 80% of the roots in the ground are actually this fungus roots. So you'll get this webbing going through the soil that's pretty intense. And it binds all the soil particles together. Uh, there's something else that goes on too. So when dead stuff lays on the ground and it dissolves, or it's eaten up by the bacteria and the protozoas and the fungi, the cellulose is consumed as energy, but the glue that holds the plant together, so plants are held together, the strands of cellulose are glued together with the chemical called lignin, which is also a type of sugar, you know, a rearranged sugar molecule. Nothing we know of eats lignin. Lignin is nature's glue. So when the bacteria, the fungi get done with the dead leaves on top of the ground, you get this glue going in the soil, and what it does is it takes all the clay particles and all the soil particles and starts blooming into bigger chunks. So the soil, instead of being all these fine, um, silty things, starts becoming chunky. The glue does that. And then there are microscopic worms and nematodes big worms, they start punching holes through all this stuff. The roots, the mycorrhizal fungi holding everything together and it's, they said it's a, 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 a soil that has grown plants for a while, it looks like Swiss cheese underneath the microscope. There's, errors, there's holes going all through it. So that's how you can make the clay soil breathe better is grow plants on there for a while. You know, grass is supposed to be nature's soil improver. It can take clay and make it breathe better because it's got a really intense root system. So, so one way to make your soil better is to just let it sit there, put a lot of dead stuff on top of it, let nature break it down, uh, and that soil will be better eventually. It may happen. For, I've seen it happen pretty fast. I mean, you put something, like if you get digested sewage sludge and just throw it out there, all that stuff has already been broken down, you see the soil just beat up underneath that within a week or so. It just kind of glues all those particles together and starts making little beads. So that can do it. Now in nature, there are what is called the rich black soil. And that's where uh, plants really grow well. Usually it's from a, a fire event, a real hot one. So if you get a really nasty wildfire, really hot, um, real intense, the tree logs will just burn up, but there's not enough oxygen there to finish the turn to ash. It just goes to charcoal. So charcoal is, you know, the inside of a log especially, just turn, if it's hot enough, Instead of going to ash, it just changes the charcoal because there's not enough air inside that log to make it go to ash. It just stays as charcoal. Uh, if there's a volcanic activity, that big plume of volcanic gases comes down, you know, it's 5,000 degrees or whatever it is, everything just turns to charcoal. No oxygen in that plume. So, uh, but uh, they said that if you go down into the Central America, into the forests, you still can find these areas in the forest that are really exceptionally green. Dig them up, you'll find a 10,000 year old campfire from the Incas or the Mayans or whatever. Because that charcoal just lasts and lasts and lasts. Nothing eats charcoal, so it can persist forever. So once you get a, a you know, like on the sides of some of the volcanoes in Italy, all this charcoal there, boy, they can grow good, great plants. So the charcoal, It's, it's inert. It acts like a mineral, but charcoal, and they use, the reason why they, one of the reasons why they use it for filters is everything sticks to it. All the minerals stick to it. Everything sticks to charcoal. So all the nutrients stick to charcoal. All the pl things that plants need stick to charcoal. Um, the organisms ground love living next to charcoal. It makes the soil real rich and healthy. So, and they said it doesn't take much the uh, National Geographic ran a good article about soil a number of years ago and they said the black rich soils of the world only have one to two percent charcoal but it makes the soil look black. 
probably just like when you break open uh, some toner in your copy machine and every, the whole office turns black. But, uh, and that's carbon. Um, I don't know if it's charcoal, but it's carbon. But uh, charcoal. Charcoal and put it in my soil just to fill up layer? You certainly can. Charcoal is uh, very expensive to make because it involves a lot of heat. So, uh, so that's one of the uh, big things that they're investing on in the agriculture industry is all this plant waste that they have to put into the landfills. Instead of doing that, turn it into charcoal. So they already, the people have already created these. They've taken the, the uh, 20 foot uh, storage boxes, containers, and made them into charcoal producing units that they can take to farms and whatever the stuff they have, they can change it into charcoal. Probably nothing, except you know there's no uh, accelerants in here that'll make it burn faster. But if it's just natural charcoal, it'll work too. <clears throat> right. So. Well, charcoal is just inert. So. Well, the reason we use charcoal is because it doesn't create fungus problems. Yeah. But I don't know that it's antiseptic or antibiotic but, or antifungal, but it's just not like the other things. Like if you put bark around an orchid, the bark is rotting. Mm -hmm. And it might take the orchid with it eventually. Whereas this doesn't rot. This is totally inert material. So it's much better than bark. If you want to grow an orchid in it for a long time, it's much better than bark. Yeah, supposedly you can grow plants in charcoal. So it would be expensive, but it should work. I, you know, I've never tried it yet. I still haven't tried it, but the books say it should work. There should be no reason why you couldn't grow plants in pure charcoal. Do you sell charcoal here? In small bags. Yeah, charcoal, I was told by our distributor, sole distributor, that one cubic foot of charcoal wholesale $50 per cubic foot. So it's very expensive to make. So, I mean, you know, you need something that doesn't have any air in it that can heat up the wood really high, hot, without oxygen. So it's, it's not an easy process, unless you have a nice volcano nearby. <laughs> okay. So, now a little bit about drainage. Drainage is kind of overrated. Now well, let's talk about the others. Let's speak about this. So decomposed granite is what you find on the side of a mountain. And basically what it is, it's this rock before the river tumbles it. So it's pretty much the same thing as this. But this is after the river makes it rounder. So decomposed granite is just like little tiny square pieces or, um, I don't know, they're, they're kind of square. Well, they're not round, let's put it that way, because the river hasn't gotten to them yet. So. Okay, so drainage is kind of overrated. Um, I mean, the main thing that we've been told, you know, that horticulture is trying to tell customers is don't overwater your plants. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. I, it's like I want to yell at them, say, it's not an issue. I mean, where in nature would too much rain cause the plants to die? When it rains here, the plants just look wonderful. It's not the water, especially rainwater, but it's not the water that causes trouble. So what we know about, the other thing we know about plants, is they need the water to contain oxygen, and water out of the tap does. So the magic numbers that the water district works with, so water out of the tap has six to eight parts per million oxygen molecules per million molecules of water 
six to eight. That's all it needs. That's, that's enough for a plant root to be very happy in water. It'll live in water forever. You know, most plants can be grown hydroponically in water as long as the oxygen content is six to eight parts million. Um, now on this table, now not all plants are equal. So on this table here, the plants on this side can get by on less oxygen in the water. The plants on this side need more oxygen. So the, you know, orchids need the most. Orchids, because they live in the air, they need like 20% if they're in water. It's got to be really, really, you know, artificially high. So you really can't get an orchid to live in water because it needs more oxygen than the water can normally hold. So it's got to be in the bark and air. It's got to have the airflow in there. But uh, these guys, you can, you can set them in water for long periods. As long as the water has the oxygen in it, boy, they can just sit in there. Now, what's interesting, you know, what, what I usually tell people, well, we know in, among crops, among tree crops, the avocado tree needs the best draining soil. So it's got high oxygen needs for its roots. Um, so a lot of nurseries, you know, when you buy an avocado from them, they'll tell you, don't water till it's really dry, because you'll kill it. Which is absurd, because these come from the rainforests of Guatemala, where it rains almost every day for long periods, and almost everybody's grown an avocado pit in a glass of water. And it's been, you know, I've seen them in a glass of water for three years. There's no drainage there, but the water's got enough oxygen in it to keep these roots alive. Clean water has, you know, clean water with good access to the environment. So you have a, a glass of water, the water circulates in the glass, and it captures the oxygen off the surface of the water, and it distributes it through. The, so the roots of the avocado can live in there an awful long time. The roots are, give, are taking up oxygen, giving off carbon dioxide. The water is clean, and it has plenty of oxygen. What ruins the oxygen content of the water is something dead in the water. Now, it depends what the dead thing is. So if you take a piece of wood, like this is a piece of wood, throw that in a, in a, in a pond somewhere, nothing happens very fast, because <laughs> this is a solid piece of wood. I mean, um, it's not going to decompose. It might take 20 years for this to decompose in this form. Now, if you bury this in the ground in three or four years, it may be gone are maybe pretty bad. But the problem is, is when you grind this up in little pieces. So you grind this up into thousands of little pieces, suddenly the uh, surface area where it can rot is much, much bigger. So when you make a particle half the size, you increase the surface area by double of all the particles. Cut this in half. Uh, well, actually, you'd have to cut it in four pieces, and suddenly the surface area that can decompose is, is twice as much. Um, so every time you make it half the radius, the surface area becomes, the more you get more pieces, the surface area doubles. So you get little pieces like they make compost out of. That thing's decomposing real fast. Throw that in water. The water loses all its oxygen. Starts smelling like a sewer in about a week. The avocado dies, and that's what kills it, that fast decomposition you get from compost. So a solid root in the ground, dead, may not cause much trouble. But you grind that root up, and root up into millions of little pieces, suddenly it's a problem. It's decomposing too fast. The oxygen is dis displaced by carbon dioxide, sewer gases. When there's not enough oxygen left, the things start decomposing, making sewer gases, which are toxic. And that's when you have your trouble in the water or in the ground. That's when that stuff is chopped up. So, um, so real clay is not a problem. Now, next week we'll talk about planting and how to do all that stuff. This week we'll do a little more on soil. So, um, so in the ground, generally as long as the water doesn't sit there for more than a week, then the oxygen content is fine. 
if the water can sit there for weeks on end, the roots eventually use up all the oxygen in the water and there's not very good circulation, especially if you have a clay soil, there's not good circulation of the oxygen in the water through that clay soil. That's when your roots can start, your, your plants start rotting away, but it does take a bit of effort. If you've got clean clay, the plants don't rot that easily. But if you've got clay and compost, uh, it can happen even without lots of water. <laughs> you know, it just, this goes, it just, you know, we, we get, still get these journalists telling you, well, add all this compost to, this, to clay soil, make it rich and black. Well, it turns black because you've created sewer gases. The only black soil that's uh, healthy is when you add charcoal to it. Now, besides charcoal, there's one other thing that works okay. Uh, humic acids or leonardite and what this is this is stuff mined out of a coal deposit in Texas so it's very similar to charcoal it's dead trees from what is it 350 million years ago that have been heated up to high temperatures it's no longer it's inert but it does hold on to minerals really well so this you can add to the soil uh, there's a lot of things like this sold that improve soil quality. They don't make it breathe better, but this will help the soil hold minerals better. So, because that's the humic acids. Um, I was reading, I was listening to something really interesting about coal, but I don't know how true this is. Uh, you know, stuff you hear on YouTube, you gotta, you gotta research into more. But this guy was saying all the coal in the world was formed more than 350 year, million years ago, or th more than 35 million, no, 350 million? More than 350 million years ago, I believe, that's what he said, because, maybe it's 35, no, it's 350, because before that, nature didn't know how to eat wood. So all the trees just left, laid there, undecomposed, and they got covered up by sediment over time, and they became coal. After that, the trees just, de de just disappeared. When they died, they disappeared. Never became coal again. But I don't know how true that one is. Okay. Now, when we grow plants in containers, um, you know, there's drain holes in the bottom of this pot. So there should be no issue with overwatering. There shouldn't be. But containers do have, an, uh, do have a problem that the ground doesn't have. So the way the ground works, um, soil is like a sponge. It holds on to water pretty good. But the ground is like an endless series of sponges. So you got the sponge holding water, but it's got another sponge underneath it. So the water is released to the next sponge, and it just goes down in the ground until it hits maybe bedrock. But uh, then they have a water table in the ground maybe... 10 feet down, 20 foot down, but the, the soil in the ground is like an endless series of sponges. The problem with the pot is most pots that we use now are non-porous. So it's like a sponge like this. It just sits there and eventually there's a layer of water just sits because there's nothing pulling that extra water out the bottom. Now for our soil, which is good soil, this is actually a plus. There's an extra bit of water down here, it's fine water. But if you've got compost in your soil, like in this plant, the water's in the compost, it's creating sewer gases down at the bottom. So that's not good. The less of that you have, the better. So, now, interestingly, you can take the same sponge, if you hold it this way, the water table's the same height, but it's more volume. So when we had the, so a lot of the um, people who work with compost soils will tell you the vertical pots are better than the horizontal pots because there's less rotting, there's less chance of rotting because the footprint of the water table, perched water table is smaller. So a taller pot, our soil doesn't matter, but if you got the normal compost, organic soils, tar pots are better for the roots than the flat bowls are. Just because there's a bigger footprint of water now. 
Again, if you've got real dirt and you've got a plant that uses water like crazy, like a weeping willow or a fig, flat pots are nice. It holds a lot of water in there. But anyway, uh, to make this perched water table smaller, the soil in a pot has to be relatively coarse. So in the old days, my dad used sandy loam. If he had clay in the pot, well, you've seen a block of clay, modeling clay on the table, it just stays wet. You know, when it's shiny, when soil is shiny, it's saturated. That means that the water is filling all the gas between the particles. So shiny clay just sits there. The water didn't come out of it. It just holds it right there. Um, sandy loam holds less water. So sandy loam, you might get a perched water table a few inches high at the bottom, maybe three inches high, because there's some clay in there. If you used uh, sand, it'd probably be only about an inch. So the coarser the materials, like pumice, maybe half an inch of water retention. So the this is all, in fact, just so you know, all these materials here are all quartz. Perlite, pumice, sand, they're all the same material, but this particle is coarser. So the water table is going to be, the perch water table, we call it, is going to be smaller. So sand, water goes from, from a coarser material to a finer textured material very well. So if you have sand sitting on top of clay, the sand will release the water to the clay. But if you have clay sitting on top of sand, the clay is not going to release the water on sand. So they said uh, the problem in Bluebird Canyon in Laguna when they had that slide was that there's a layer of sand, a thin layer of clay, and then sand below it. So the water from the rains would penetrate the sand, hit the clay layer, it became like grease. They said the water just stayed right there. It became a grease layer, and the top layer of sand with the clay below it just slid off the soil below it, and the whole hillside came down. So that's, that's what you don't want. You don't want sand on top of clay. Clay on top of, excuse me, you don't want clay on top of sand. Sand on top of clay is not a big issue. So if you have clay soil and you want to bring sandy soil on top of it, it works fine. Uh, my mother did that. We did that at her house back in the 80s. Uh, she wanted to redo her yard, which was solid clay in her neighborhood. And we brought in, um, it was actually a mixture of sandy loam and decomposed granite. <laughs> we made it this high and just put it on top of the clay soil. And everything did really, really well in that mixture. We didn't mix into the soil, we just put it on top. Eight inches of a mixture of these two items. I don't know, we had a worker, an employee for a, at that time, Rick Carrasco. And he would go down to Larry's Building Supply in Costa Mesa, and he liked to mix these two together. So he said, try it at your mom's house and see how you like it. Um, and the, he did it so often down at uh, Larry's Building Materials, they, they started calling it Rick's Mix because Rick Carrasco would always order these two mixed together equal parts. So now they have a product called Rick's Mix, which is just these two. I mean, this is just post-river, and this is pre-river, same material, essentially. But this is a bit coarser. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, I do like the feel of decomposed granite. It's pretty nice. It's not as gummy as real dirt is. So it's kind of neat stuff to work with. Yes, in bulk. Now, if you go down to Larry's, if you bring buckets, they'll let you take buckets of this stuff. Larry's Building Materials in Costa Mesa. They're on Baker Street. Not that I know of. Because most places it's in bulk, and the only way you can get bulk materials generally is if you have a pickup truck. So if you have a pickup truck or know someone who has one, you go down to a building supply yard, and there's building supply yards in most uh, bad-looking areas of neighborhoods. <laughs> you know, like in Mission Vale, there's Sepulveda building materials along the railroad tracks. Uh, and there's uh, Valley building materials along the riverbed. And uh, Larry's is on Baker Street. But they have the open block bins filled with different soils. Now, do not buy anything called, do not buy topsoil. 
because these guys who know tractors, you know, front loaders and uh, dump trucks, don't know anything about ground plants. So they take good sandy loam and they mix it 40 to 50 percent compost and they, then they call it topsoil. And they sell it to everybody and it kills people's yards totally. They can't grow anything in it except for these plants. They can grow these plants. Can't grow anything over here but they can grow all of those because those don't need much oxygen in the ground. I mean, that's the sad thing about our industry is because we're not teaching people to treat the soil right, the soil doesn't have enough oxygen in it. Everything on this side, and roses are on this side too, roses, lilies, um, pines, juniper, cypresses, that's what you see in people's yards that do well, grass. You don't see many of these things because people plant them the way they're, they're taught to and they all die because there's not enough oxygen in the ground. Wait, wait, don't buy anything called topsoil because the people who have the dump trucks don't know enough and they mix like this. Now this is how I learned about dirt because I didn't know anything in 1990, early 90s, I bought my last house, needed to fill all these raised beds needed 17 truckloads of dirt. So I called up the soil company and said, what's your best soil to fill all these beds up? They said, top soil. So I filled them all. And uh, half a year later, well, about a year later, half the stuff was dead. We're going, I'm a nurseryman. My other house, nothing like this happened. What just happened? What's happening? Why can't I grow anything in this soil? Which they told me was the best. So it took us a few years to figure it out. It was the soil. You can't do that to the soil. You can't put 40% organic matter in the soil and expect it to live. Now, what's interesting is University of California, you know, the agriculture division knows the right stuff. They know everything correctly. So they did a survey of farms in California in 1950 and said that the farm soils in California and in nature too, nature is the same thing. So farm soil, 1950, the average in California was 0.9% organic matter. And that happens to be what it is in nature, 0.9%. If you go through the soil, you go through the soil and see how much organic matter in there, less than 1%. Probably dead roots, maybe a few pieces of leaves in there. It's what you see floating in here. Well, there's uh, a little bit of green in there, so you know there's a little bit of something in there. So, but it's not much. So in, in the year 2000, the University of California went back and checked all the farms in California again to see how the farmers were doing. They want to make sure they weren't messing up their dirt. 2000, 1.1%. They said, boy, farmers doing a good job. That's perfect. 1.1% organic matter is perfect level of organic matter in the soil. Not what is stated on the packs of planter mix bags. They're telling you go 50-50. Yes. Not much. Um, we'll talk about that next week. But the University of California actually went around the Central Valley surveyed all the soils and all the plants that grew there. They said the soil does not, did not, whatever was happening in the soil did not affect the plant growth. Their conclusion was the plants they were surveying, which were a lot of the native plants, did not get anything from the soil itself. Because no matter what the soil was like, high pH, low pH, sandy, clayish, the same plants grew. They said all they did was recycle dead leaves on the surface. They were not getting things from the soil itself. So. So the soil is just the house. It's just your home. It's where the plants live, but they don't eat it. They don't get... Yeah. Well, it's like your house. Insulation, you know, moisture. You get water in there. You get air in there. And that's what you need. It doesn't provide your food for you. That's an input. So... Ask for Rick's mix. Rick's. 
if you want that, you get Rick's mix. Larry has it? Larry's building materials in Costa Mesa. You just put it on top of the soil or do you mix it with whatever? You can do either way, but it'll work just on top because it's perfect soil. Uh, it depends on the size of the pot. So if you have a pot about this big, yeah. that tall, Rick's mix will probably work fine. If it's any shorter than that, I wouldn't use it. Your water table would be too high. So on the water table on that soil, it'd probably be about like this. Uh -huh. uh, so that's the thing you have to be careful. That's why we made our own soil, our own potting soils, because they're coarser. So the coarser you go, the less water table you have. Um, and we'll talk about our soil here in a second. But anyway, organic matter, 1.1%. Now, what they also found out, what the U.S. Department of Agriculture found out, and other scientists too, is the average depth of organic matter on top of the ground is 5 inches. They call it duff. And to this day, i got to believe duff is short for dead stuff. But... That's it, five inches on top of the ground. That's where the nutrition is stored for the soil. It can be a lot deeper than that. I mean, the Sierra foothills, you get underneath those oak trees, it's deep. Uh, a friend of mine went to Guatemala. He wanted to see how deep the dead leaves were underneath the avocado trees. He said they dug through five foot of dead leaves piled up underneath those trees. So it can get pretty deep. So uh, your soil should be mineral down here, organic on top. That's the way it should be set up. Yes. Okay, so um, what I'm listening to your name is that instead of like going here to clean all my yard, you know, from dead leaves and you know whatever, I said just leave them there. I know that they don't look good. Right. But I just put them, but you know, I said don't clean them up. Right. They don't make good soil, they feed the plant. Yeah, it's food. It's food. Yeah. It's yeah. food. It's yeah. food. Yeah. And then sometimes I ask him to you know, cultivate a little bit. Or just don't have to. Don't have to. Nature, nature cultivates itself. And then on top of that, I should put the decomposed granite and the seed Not on top of your dead leaves. It's got to be underneath the dead leaves. All right. So if you have dead leaves there, pull them aside. Put that on top if you want to, and then put the dead leaves back. But your dead leaves will improve the soil themselves. Yeah. You may not have to bring anything different in. And, you know, again, clay soil is not poisonous to plants. The plants can live in it just fine. The transition is what's hard. So if you get a plant that's growing in compost and you put it into clay, it just rots because of this stuff in here. In the clay, doesn't breathe well enough to decompose properly, and so it rots. If you put this in sandy soil, it has a good chance because this rotting material won't go septic or won't turn into sewer gases. But if you put this in clay soil, it's got a hard problem getting started. Uh, so next week we talk about removing this and getting the plants going. Uh, now a friend of mine who is a who is a contractor. All the time he's been in business, he says, he's just done this. He takes the plants, you know, pulls them out of the pot, surrounds them with three or four inches of sand. And he doesn't lose anything. So that's a good strategy because he gave this plant enough air around it so that this wouldn't rot. Even though it's, it's surrounded by clay beyond that, it's got a ch good chance to get started in there. So that's one strategy of doing it. But he was smart. He surrounded everything with sand back in, you know, it was back 70s and 80s when he was doing that. So we knew really well. Now, you know, I remember when my dad planted his yard back in the 60s. Pure clay. Nothing died. Nothing rotted. Because the plants in the 60s were in the right soil. Nowadays, you do that, everything's rotting. And they're telling you, oh, you're watering too much. So you don't water, and now they, then they tell you, oh, you didn't water enough. Um, so it's just, it's just a, a pain. I mean, one of the 
things you see when the plant doesn't have, you know, it's in the wrong dirt. So I got these from a friend a year ago, and he wasn't using real good soil. So when we got this plant, the leaves look like that. They're all brown tipped, a little bit off colored. So we, we took all his dirt off, put it in our soil, and the rest of it looks like that. He was here this week, he looks at my plants, he goes, boy, those turned out nice. Because <laughs> he doesn't have a clue. It's hard to teach people who've been doing the wrong thing for a long time that to change what they're doing. Although, just put in our, just put in better dirt. So, what is the brown tipping caused by? The we're not sure. Um, we think it's that's what lack of root system does. Lack of root system. Okay. Right, because I mean we've been amazed. You know, we'll take plants out of the compost and look at the roots, and like sometimes there's only two or three healthy ones in the whole pot. Okay. I mean, back in the '60s, if you had nur got nursery plants, you put them in the pot. The biggest complaint back in the 60s, all these roots circling around and around and around. They said, your plants are root bound. That's what they told my dad, your plants are root bound. So nowadays, you put plants into the pot, you see all these brown roots and you hardly see anything. And that's supposed to be better than the circling white roots that we had in the old days. But uh, anyway, so, So, so it's potting soil, so let's talk about that. What happened to potting soil? So uh, the original potting soil was sand. So people who have been growing plants in pots a long time, China, Japan, with their bonsai plants for hundreds of years, they say thousands, I say hundred. I don't think they've been growing them for, well, maybe thousands of years. And then the orangeries in France in the 1800s, they made these huge pots and put citrus trees in and invented greenhouse, put the citrus trees in the greenhouse. So they analyzed the sand in those big pots of citrus. They said they were 97% sand. And I, my father's bonsai book, they never talked about using compost as a soil. You know, they didn't know that, well, of course, they didn't have any way to grind up plants in those days either. So they just use different forms of dirt. So in bonsai, what they want to do is they want to make the leaves smaller. The way you do that is you make the soil more clay-like. The roots have trouble growing in there. The, everything starts coming out smaller and smaller. Shorter growth, internodes and all that. So they make the trees look smaller. So you have to add clay to your soil to make it do that. Uh, so they have all these formulas on, you know, taking a good loam and what proportions to mix with it to create this certain textures. Um, but they would have a warning in the, at the end of the chapter, if your plants start rotting in the pot, take them out of that pot, take off that soil, and put them into pure sand until they recover. So they knew that pure sand made the most vigorous growth, but they didn't want that in bonsai. They didn't want the real vigorous, big leaves, big long stems. They wanted real small leaves, short stems. Do that, they need more clay. So they manipulated the amount of clay and sand in the, in the soil to do that work. So they knew what was going on. I mean, most of the world knows what's going on. What's wrong with the U.S.? <clears throat> so in the 1950s, which I, when I was a kid, I played in my dad's dirt pile. So I know this soil really well. I used to make forts and things with it. And, it, you know, you can make things out of it, but it would never harden in anything. You can just punch it and you know, add water, make little castles, but you punch it and it just breaks apart. So that was the sandy loam. I, I totally remember this type of soil. Um, but in the 60s, the main thing was he was told that he had to make the soil lighter because in those, you know, now, just so you know, one cubic foot of granite weighs 178 pounds. One cubic foot of sandy loam is about 120. Uh, one cubic foot of sand, you know, you buy, the, there's these bags of sand that are 100 pounds. They're about a cubic foot. So sand's a little, sand is considered light soil. It only weighs 100 pounds per cubic foot. So when we had real five-gallon buckets, now these nowadays aren't five-gallon at all. They're 3.8. But we used to have five-gallon buckets filled with sandy loam. 
kids and, and women couldn't lift them. They were heavy, like 40, 50 pounds of dirt in there. So the in trade said, we got to get this lighter. So they asked the universities, how do you make lighter sulfur pots? So the original formula, they said sand and peat, half and half. Yeah, peat moss is a dead plant, but it's been dead for tens of thousands of years. So it, even though it still decomposes, it decomposes real slow. So it, it, it's a decent soil uh, substitute because it, you can put peat moss in a bucket of water, nothing happens. It doesn't smell like a sewer at all because uh, it it's been sitting in a lake for forever. So it decomposes at a very slow rate. So that worked. However, both sand and peat are expensive for the trade. So they asked them again, how do you make this cheaper? And so the university came back, well, you can make it like up to one-third fur bark fines, which is cheaper and lightweight. Not as good as peat, but it's cheaper. So they went to that for a while. Now, one thing, in California, we went, now California is really the only place where they grew container plants uh, up until the 1980s. The rest of the country, except for southern Florida, southern Texas, you can't grow things in containers. Because in the wintertime, if everything above ground froze, the containers froze too, you'd lose your plants. So they would have to stick them in greenhouses if they were in containers. Uh, so they didn't really grow container plants. They grew everything in the ground, and when they sold it, they just dug it up, wrapped it in burlap, and those plants are great. But in California, we kind of introduced container growing because we don't freeze here. So um, for a while, what they did, and this company still does this. It's not great, but it's not too bad. Redwood sawdust. So this grower, I know them well, because their website says this too, 75% redwood sawdust, 25% sand. Now redwood is the slowest decomposing wood. So you can do a decent job with redwood, although it's not perfect, it's decent. It won't kill it. Although there's the citrus they grow aren't very good looking. Uh, and neither are the avocados, but at least they don't die like some growers. So this company, um, has told me, or they promoted that said at trade shows, their plants are voted the best looking because everybody else does a much worse job than they do. But even they don't know what real dirt is. They, they use redwood. But redwood, again, is the least bad wood to use. Now, redwood puts out tannins, which discolor plants. If you look at a plant from them and a plant from us, the same plant, ours are different colored because the redwood does create some talk uh, some strange colors in the leaves so uh, but anyway so in the 60s my dad I remember because my dad's soil particle his soil pa changed all of a sudden go we can't play in this stuff it's got sawdust mixed in it but it was redwood sawdust and it wasn't that much they were only mixing maybe 30 percent in those days because they didn't they didn't really trust the sawdust which was a good thing so in the 60s and 70s, we got by with redwood sawdust and sandy loam. And most of the growers in, in California did that. But what happened in the late 70s, redwood forests suddenly disappeared. They had chopped down all the virgin forests except in the national parks. So redwood suddenly got real expensive. So they went to fur shavings. Uh, fur shavings in the early 80s, boy, things were rotting left and right. We just couldn't believe it. My dad was growing plants, and they, uh, half the stuff was rotting. We're going, okay, what's going on here? It was getting so bad, I told my dad, stop growing, just buy from the other growers. Uh, the ag department came in and told him, you can't water your plants every day. Now, what's, inter what's, what's weird is that from the 1950s to the 1980s, he had watered his plants every day. He told me when I was a kid, growing plants is so easy. You water every day, and you fertilize once a month. And suddenly in the 80s, it wasn't working. So, you know, I was in my 20s in the 80s, and he, he told me, you figure this out. I can't, I just can't deal with it. I, I've watered every day all my life, and suddenly I'm told it's wrong. And that's when, the, you know, we changed to fur shavings as the soil, as the soil uh, substitute. 
Anyway, the industry figured out bark was better than shavings bark, decomposed a little slower. So now most of the industry uses redwood bark. I mean, excuse me, fir bark. So fir bark is the in thing now. Um, a few growers use, still use a lot of peat, but peat is expensive, so they mix a little bit of wood shaving or wood a tree product in with it, and they still get the rotting going on. But uh, the ones that use, there are a few growers out there, a few of them, who, you, who do not use wood or tree products, this peat moss and perlite. So peat moss, again, which doesn't cause too much trouble, but peat moss doesn't breathe by itself. If you plant a, grow a plant in peat, uh, for a while peat is permeable, but in a short time it becomes non-permeable, and plants don't, roots don't breathe anymore, so you've got to mix it. So in the trade, the most famous mix, uh, there's a company in, based in Canada that takes the peat moss from the lakes and mix with perlite, 20% perlite, 80% peat, and they say this is a great mix. And those people who grow those plants, they turn out really pretty. But after a year and a half, the peat is so non-permeable, even the perlite can't do it anymore. That company challenged me back in the 90s. They said, uh, our soil will grow just as good as your soil, which doesn't have as much peat in it. And so I said, oh, well, it'll be, it'll be a two-year test, though. So we put these Habote Kaba trees, which are real sensitive to uh, bad soil, in their mix, in our mix. One year later, the sales rep come back identical. They look, both look perfect. Their soil holds up for close to a year, so their plant was good. Second year, their plant hadn't grown an inch beyond that. Our plant was about twice as big, so we never came back. But uh, so anyway, our mix. Yep. What plant did you say you guys used? It was a uh, Haboticaba. It's not Jaboticaba? Jaboticaba. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was our test plan because we know those are sensitive. Right, right. So anyway, um, I was, I actually what happened is I talked to a soil scientist that worked for NASA around 1992. Same time I had that problem with the planter bed in my backyard. And he told me my industry was crazy. They didn't know what they're doing, but they won't listen to him. But... He was a scientist for NASA. They were sending up soil into the space shuttle, potting soil in the space shuttle. He says, you guys don't know what you're doing. But no one listens to me. And I said, well, I'll listen to you because back in the 80s, you know, whenever we tried to put an indoor plant in potting soil, like super soil in those days, it didn't make it. The ferns slowly died. The, all the palms slowly died in it. Put a, a citrus tree into super soil. It just sat there. It wouldn't grow. Put it in the ground, it grew. So I knew there was something wrong with what we were doing. Um, so he showed me what he was up to. And he said he got his ideas when he was surfing over in um, Hawaii. Now he got paid a lot. He said he got paid like 1500 bucks an hour um, because he was real smart. But he was surfing in Hawaii. He noticed Hawaii was real lush. It was all volcanic rock. So, he's, so, that, and his, so he got the notion that plants don't really need organic matter soil because there's nothing like that in Hawaii. Uh, so he started growing plants in pure pumice. He found a volcano down in New Mexico that he owns the mineral rights to. You take that pumice rock and put in your hands and blow and it just floats. It's really light. But he says that unfortunately in the space shuttle everything floats. So they had to use spun glass. Same material, uh, quartz. So instead of using pumice, but he gave me some of his pumice. I mean, you know, a bucket like this would weigh nothing. It's lighter than even lighter than perlite. Neat stuff. But he says that he, down by where he lived in Laguna Niguel, he wouldn't even have to water this stuff. It would collect water at night. The air going through it, the humid air going through at night, the water condenses into the soil particles. So we would have to hardly even water. But... Uh, Anyway, we worked with that for a while, but boy, in Lake Forest, where we were, it dried out too fast. So then I asked the guys over at UC Riverside, what holds water the best? Now, clay holds water the best, but clay won't give it up. You know, you can't suck clay dry. 
but you can suck peat moss dry. So peat moss, they told me, was the best material in horticulture to hold water. Pumice is the best material to allow airflow. These are two opposites. So we decided back in the early 90s, well, put these together, half and half, see what we get. And we got our acid mix. So because it's got a lot of peat in there, it's half peat, half pumice rock, uh, pH on it's around 5.6 or something like that. It's not super acidic because the pumice happens to be somewhat alkaline around here. But it works really well. I mean, we've never changed it because for a lot of people, this is what they've used since the early 90s and they won't change. So this one, it, with 50% pumice instead of like 20% perlite, this all breathes forever. It doesn't change. The peat moss slowly breaks down, but the plant stays alive. We've had plants living in that for 10 years easily. So, uh, and... Camellias, gardenias. Right. So ferns, camellias, gardenias, blueberries, stuff like that. Uh, it grows really well in there. I mean... Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is not quite as permanent. So the peat moss does lose volume as it ages. So it does shrink about 15% um, or so. Right. Right. So unfortunately with roses, you can add this on top, and the roses will root through their stems. It's okay. It doesn't hurt them. So anyway, that's, so we said, okay, this stuff does shrink. Uh, we'll recommend it more for plants that are annuals and pretty like vegetables, flowers, where you, they don't live that long anyway, that's fine. Uh, or things that need it highly acidic like blueberries and azaleas and those things. Uh, but let's make something more permanent, less peat. So the next thing we did, so we chose a plant that was hard to grow, which are gardenias, and said, okay, let's make a, a soil that won't shrink that we can grow gardenias in. So we made it less peaty, um, more inert material, but to keep the weight down. So we had a mix that was 70% pumice and 30% peat, which is fine, but 70% 70, 70, 70 pumice in the bag, yeah, it's really heavy. <laughs> it's hard to lift it. So we decided, okay, let's use other materials that are lighter. So we, you know, I, although I'm not a fan of perlite, we made it, we put perlite in here, pumice in here, charcoal. We put the charcoal in here. Double duty, it's lightweight, uh, it does hold nutrients well, costs like crazy. <laughs> I mean, they're going to raise the price on this one way over our ass mix, but we convinced them, you know, this. Just make it a darm or whatever. So anyway, that's so this is only one third peat. And at one third peat, uh, it'll settle for a few weeks, but after that it doesn't seem to shrink at all. What we think happens when there's only one third peat in there is that the peat moss isn't contributing to the total volume of, of the material. Just like sand and 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 round particles two-thirds volume of that and one-third air in there. Well, we think the peat moss is sitting between the particles in the air spaces and not really contributing to volume. So even though the peat moss shrinks, it no longer changes the level of the soil, either that or the roots make up the difference real fast. So, so anyway, worked on gardenias. Here's a gardenia. It's been in our top pot for about a year, a little over a year. So you get some nice looking roots. Right. Oh, wow. Very nice. So that's what we like the roots to look like. They should be light colored. If they're dark or slimy, then they're on their way out. But uh, you want something that stays put. Yeah, we water everything we grow here. At least when it's above uh, 80 degrees, we water everything every day that we grow. If it's something else, someone else grows that we got to watch out. <laughs> so, we had to make up, back in the 80s, when we, when we didn't know what was going on, we had to make up a lot of rules to handle the plants growing in compost. Like, don't water till the soil is dry looking on top. If the soil is dry on top, it was no longer saturated at the bottom. 
If it looked wet on top at all, it was saturated down here. You'd wipe it out yeah. with you know water that, when it was still wet on top, within a couple days, it started turning yellow. It was that sensitive. You had to make sure that all the water was out of the soil so that the air can get back in before you water it again. And if you put too much compost around the plant, you know, too much potting soil around here, you kill it. <laughs> because the compost is stealing the oxygen. So you put a big, you put a little plant in a big pot, that's history, it's gone. And they still tell people that, don't make your pots, don't put, don't graduate your plants too quickly. Well, the ground is fine. You can put a plant in the ground. There's no problem there. In our soil, you can put you know, a plant like this in a half barrel. There's no issue. The soil doesn't steal the oxygen. So, I mean, the weirdest thing to me was in the 80s, I was complaining to one of our big growers, why are your alocastias rotting when I water every day? It's a water plant. They didn't have any answers. <laughs> so their plants rot in water but it's supposed to live in water. It's because they couldn't figure out that their soil was not, doesn't, is not good for water. So this plant is a water plant. It should live underwater. So when we do it, we can, we can do it. So a lot of the natives, you know, one of the things we've heard lately, you know, the, what is it, the organization that's promoting um, less water use, they're telling customers, they have to change their stand. Like it was, you know, one thing was plant natives. Now they're saying, don't plant natives <laughs> because no one can keep them alive. Um, the natives haven't been in, in culture that long, so we haven't had the chance to choose the ones that can live in compost yet. So I was emailing earlier this year to Matteo Gabalito, Dr. Matteo Gabalito, I think that's his last name, UC Berkeley. They were studying why all the replanting projects in California along the highways are just failing. And he says, the plants are, have root rot when we install them from the growers. They come with root rot. So I emailed them. I said, yeah, this is interesting. Um, it's the ground up wood that's causing that. He says, I concur. They shouldn't be planting plants in recycled plant material. So that's the state of it. So a lot of the official stances, you make a low water garden, do not use natives, use, uh, just use low, moderate water plants. Moderate water being things like privets, raphiolopus, a lot of the irises, plants that can get by with 20% less water and won't die, but not the natives because the natives aren't making it. Most of the natives that are grown by the growers just rot. Now we know one grower, Las Palitas, Central California or slightly Northern California, their website, they said, why don't nurseries grow plants in real dirt? They know what's going on. But they're the only one I, I've, I've met. I've heard there's one nursery on the East Coast that thinks the way I do. That's it. But I emailed the big wigs of the industry, and they don't think there's a problem. I, I told them, our customers complain everything they touch dies. Everything they plant dies when they plant according to instructions. And the industry doesn't think it's a problem because they don't hear about it. So, like, we're a grower retailer. We grow stuff, we get the feedback. The problem with the industry is now it's changed from grower retailer to this growers and retailers, and sometimes there's another middleman in between. So the growers don't hear anything from the people who grow their plants. And in fact, a lot of times, you know, what happens is... The plants don't die right away, they die a couple years down the road. And, the re and, the, and even the homeowner doesn't think it's the, re the grower's problem. But when we've grown plants over the years, we found out exactly how the different soil mixes work. So like um, from this one grower in Northern California, everything I planted from them died exactly three years after they were planted. And we pulled them out of the ground, the roots in our soil were fine. The roots right underneath the, the stem of their plants was totally slimy and rotten. Their root ball had killed that plant, even though it had grown, into, out, grown out to the soil around it. Three years, everything. Another grower I had, five years. 
everything died in five years. And a third grower, everything died about 10 years down the road. So they're using longer lasting wood products, apparently. But three other growers, nothing ever died. One had used the redwood sawdust and sand. Theirs never died. Uh, another one had redwood sawdust and, and regular dirt. And, and they didn't put that much redwood in it, so theirs were fine. And the last grower was this peat moss and perlite. Theirs never died. So we found out, you know, what these growers do. So I started not buying from certain growers. I mean, we still buy from the grower whose things died in three months because they have got some really interesting things, but we change the soil. We take a lot of stuff, we, you know, like, like some plants don't die because they don't stay in that root ball very long. You get a canna lily, it's moving. So this is from that grower. This plant will be over here by next spring. It'll be out of that root ball. Even though this can kill it, it's not gonna be in there very long. Or, you know, the grasses, the palms, I don't worry about those. Although I should, but I don't. We're starting to grow on more and more stuff, but, you know, we just have a half acre here, which is real tiny for a nursery. I've got a growing ground, small growing ground in my backyard, and I've got a small growing ground in a friend's yard. Maybe 2,000, 3,000 square feet total, so I don't have that much land to do all this stuff on. So we're kind of limited, but we grow, you know, the plants we like the most, we grow ourselves. So... Yes. On the root ball, you took that out of the pot. You got rid of all the soil and replaced it with fresh soil. Would that be okay? For a lot of most plants, it'll work. So uh, again, next week that's our topic. Next week to show you how to do that stuff. But uh, like the f the funnest one we do is bougainvillea. Mm -hmm. So. The most, one of the most interesting things about bougainvillea is when I came into the trade, they always told me, you got to be real gentle with this plant. There's hardly any roots in that pot. If you lose the soil, the plant's just going to die. Well, it turns out the bougainvilleas hate the soil they're growing in. That's why there's no roots in there. But they would tell us, you know, to hold everything together, get it into the ground intact with all that bad soil around it. So now we tell our customers, Shake it all off. <laughs> you know, just, just be real rough with it. Shake. So uh, a couple years ago, we have two bougainvilleas, uh, one by each entry, entrance and exit. And I had one of my new employees do this a couple years ago. I said, take this bougainvillea out there and just bare root it. You can cut off maybe a top foot or so uh, and put it in the ground. He says, it's going to die. I said, no, just, just watch what happens. So he did it, reluctantly he did it, and then he came back, running back a couple of days later, said, all the leaves are falling off. I said, that's fine, that's what the plant's supposed to do. So when the leaves are falling off, the plant says, I'm too dry, I don't have enough roots, I'm dropping my leaves to save myself. And then uh, two weeks later, it started regrowing, and now you look at those things, they're just massive, full green plants. Uh, whereas if we don't do that, the plants get real ugly toward winter. Uh, especially if it rains a lot, the root system just can't handle it too well. I mean, what we know, now this one's been changed. So when this plant, before we changed the dirt, it made leaves kind of like uh, these right here. And then after we changed it, this happened. We cut it down to here and it just regrew all this stuff. Gorgeous foliage now. But, um, what was I going to say? But bougainvillea is generally when, what we believe so that when we'd have bougainvilleas and didn't make the soil better, every winter all the leaves would fall off and all the flowers would fall off. They just looked totally dormant in the wintertime. And then when the soil warmed up again, they started growing again around April, May and came back. I thought, well, what's causing that? Well, it turns out that when the soil in here is uninhabitable, all the roots of this plant are either right along the, there's a gap on the edge of the root ball, so they live on the gap where, there's no, where they can breathe, or on the top. But being on the sides or on the top, they're definitely more exposed to the cold. So you get cold weather, the roots just freeze. That's it, the plant goes dormant. Whereas when we put our soil around them, the roots can live in the middle very well. So they look, they bloom throughout the year. The cold doesn't affect them at all because the soil is insulating them now. But you take a bougainvillea that's not in the right soil, all the roots are on the, either on the top or on the sides.
no insulation. They just go to sleep. So we think that happens to an awful lot of plants that look bad in the winter. The roots are at the very surface of the ground where they can breathe, and then they go downhill for the winter time. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I didn't cover that part yet. So, so the the people who seem to know more about soil than in the U.S. The U.S. The agriculture people know. The horticulture people just are clueless. In fact. One of the newest things that they've been doing, we get notices all the time, instead of using this random wood, which they can't predict what will happen, they now have this thing called um, wood fiber. So they make it very uniform by you know, processing the wood and making their medium uniform, but it's still wood. They don't get it. They're trying to make wood work better. But anyway, the people I've, I've read a lot of information about about these products, Holland. Holland is, their whole industry is based on hothouse growing. It's like their whole economy is based on that, you know, stuff to eat, flowers, things like that. So they have to know the best soils to use. In the, and, you know, growing in hothouse is real expensive compared to farms. So they've got to have the best dirt. So they did done a lot of research. The government itself just does the research. They said we can't depend on you know private people to do it. We're just going to do this research. So they said the materials that are best used for growing plants containers. They did say sand is fine, pumice, perlite, uh, rock wool, which is this molten rock that's made into strands, and clay pellets are real interesting. Clay pellets. You know, clay doesn't breathe, but when you fire it into little beads, it's got the best of both worlds. Uh, it holds water because it's porous, but there's a lot of air in it because it's fired into beads. So it's kind of a neat one. It it's fired, so it stays pellets. Yeah. On the organic side, they said there's a few organic materials that do work because they can predict what will happen. So pure peat moss can be used for a period of about a half a year. It works for about half a year, so they know it well. It's cheap to get. And coconut core, which is a chopped up hole of a coconut, uh, works for about the same length of time. It decomposes at a, at a very predictable rate. For, so, for some short crops, this is fine. Now, it's interesting that you know, the people who sell this will tell you there's a shortage of this. It's like. All of Russia's peat. How can there be a... They said, you know, all the peat in the U.S. is taken out of one lake in Canada. You know, uh, it's, the whole lake is peat moss. It's like, these people... The people really need work, though, down in India and Sri Lanka where this stuff comes from. <laughs> you know, how many rice holes... I mean, coconut holes, husk are there in nature versus how many peat bogs there are in Russia and in Canada. It's like, no contest. I don't know. Uh, there's not enough of this being sold to make it as cheap as this, though. So this is probably cheaper. It's probably cheaper because it's coming less distance, too. Okay. But uh, they, those are both predictable. Okay. Rice holes. Um, interesting because rice holes are 90% silica. They don't decompose. But it's good for... It's a good, they said it's a good right. substitute for perlite. But they're almost the same material. The silicon dioxide, this is silica. Um, they said they, the, all the rice holes that they grow, that they make and that they create in Sacramento because they grow a lot of rice there, they stuff them to the levees. They said you can stick your hand in a levee from the 1950s and pull out rice holes that look brand new. So the stuff just doesn't decompose. So this is actually a good growing medium that's light. I asked my, my soil distributor if they would use rice holes instead of some of these other materials, they said, no, the problem with the rice holes are too light. So you make a big pile of it and the wind blows, it's, it is everywhere. So they don't use it, but some nurseries do put rice holes into their mix of, with their wood. <laughs> you know, It's a little better than the wood, but it's not perfect. But if they just use rice holes instead of these wood products. So anyway, um, they said charcoal can work too, but it's too expensive. 
but they said they spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how to make, well, in, in Europe, they invented the pallet system of transporting goods. So they got plenty of old wood there. They said they can't use it. And they experiment with bark, can't use it. They said the problem with wood and bark is that one piece of wood is not uniform. Parts of the wood will decompose immediately. Parts will last for years. They can't predict, they can't tell the farmer how long this stuff will last. It may decompose all of a sudden and they lose their entire crop. So they can't use any of the ground up tree products, which is what all the nurseries in the U.S. use. And we've had nurseries tell us we lost our entire community crop because we had a bad batch of bark. They shouldn't have just, they should have just used peat, perlite, sand, the stuff they used to use. I mean, it's the newest, you know, it's not the nursery's fault. They, as their growers got older, the good guys that knew what they're doing, the new generation of growers from the 19, late 80s on were taught by the universities that soil is bad, bark is good. So that generation came out and, you know, I was, I would talk to horticultural professors face to face. They tell me, you can't grow plants in real dirt. <laughs> it's just, you know, I mean, this whole thing is almost like um, that fairy tale, fairy tale uh, Emperor's New Clothes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The intellectuals can't see it. It takes yeah. someone who's not trained to tell them that you got, you know, that's not real dirt. Yeah. But uh, it's just, it's a crime. I mean, and the problem is, is the universities in California are the ultimate source of information. So. The city of Santa Monica lost all their trees that they got from one grower who's now gone, Valley Crest, so I can say their name. And we stopped buying from them in the 90s because all their trees would die because they had too much compost around the roots. So the city of Santa Monica lost their trees and they sued the company. The lower court says, fine, apparently they rotted. The state court came back and said, you can't sue this company because they grew their trees according to the university. The university's right, the company's right, you killed the trees. So that's the state of our industry right now is that, you know, um, sense is gone. <laughs> you have to listen to the guys with the PhDs. So, um, so anyway, we are uh, selling our soil, our top pot. Uh, this one's $14.99 if you just buy one bag, but we do have discounts for volume. I mean, our supplier, you know, we told our supplier that other nurseries or other people want it, so put in their system so that other people can buy it. Well, they said, well, your product is fairly expensive, so we'll make it a premium price. <laughs> so because they're distributing it now, and I guess taking money to distribute, I don't know what they're doing, but they, they raised our price on us. So anyway, it's a little more than we'd like to see it. Uh, last year was $12.99, now it's $14.99. But uh, we do discounts at 5 and 10, so if you buy 10, you get 15% off. If you buy 5, you get 10% uh, off. But we do sell it now at uh, quite a few nurseries in California have bought it, not because they wanted to, it's because our customers have begged them to. It, you know, nowadays, I can't go to a nursery and tell them this is better than yours because they don't grow anything, they don't care. But if our customers go there and demand it and pay for it, then they start carrying it. So hopefully, you know, our distributor can go from Colorado to Washington. So hopefully we can get this thing distributed that far and make some, and make some you know, so I can retire. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so I can retire. Right now it's, it's, it's in a few stores, maybe less than 10. But it's, 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 it's increasing. So. Uh, this one is thirteen ninety nine, with the same volume discounts. Okay. We have smaller bags of this at eight ninety nine that are one about forty percent as big as that. Well, if you want to make your soil more acid, you add sulfur to it, or you can add peat moss, right? Okay. Yeah, I'll go over this stuff next week. Well, this was kind of neat. So this is a natural soap, 
and it helps get the soil wetter. So if you've got, like, a, say your lawn, the water just sits on top, or you have silty soil and the water just sits on top of them, soak in, you spray this over it, and for three months, the water absorbs faster. So like in the summertime, if you're having trouble keeping your lawn green, you spray this on the lawn, the water soaks in much quicker for three months. So. And what's the product? You said it's a soap? Or? Yeah, it's a soap. Soil penetrant. Um, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Essentially a non-ionic soap, biodegradable soap. Now, this I said was the best growing medium for hothouses. So the world's most ex valuable crop, that's what they use pretty exclusively. So if you go on any marijuana operation, you see clay pellets being used to grow them because it is the apparently the best soil medium to grow plants and the fastest growth so you give them the input like you'd have to water this probably two or three times a day oh, wow. but and then fertilize like crazy and then if you're in a if you're in a hothouse you can also add the carbon dioxide to the air and your plants will grow really really quick so. okay yeah, quick mm-hmm Bark, ground up bark, yeah, big bark chunks, yeah. Good. Anything on top of the ground is fine. You can have, you can pile it. There are some farms up north that put uh, ground up trees, you know, they just call up the arborist, 18 inches deep on top of the ground. Right, right. Make, just make sure where the roots, plant roots are, there's nothing dead down there, or very little dead. Right. Right. You need that mulch. That's critical for the plants. That's their nutrition source. Okay. Ins more insulation, all that. So. Stops erosion. A lot of things. Well, it's a little bit too light. So it, it comes up to the surface when you water, it floats. Oh, okay, that's what you like. So. But this is lighter. <laughs> so. It's fine. Yeah. It's a good growing medium. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.